2308, Mr. Zandi is representing Mr. Curtis. Ms. Baldwin represents Ms. Wynn. Uh, Ms. Wynn is present, as is Ms. Baldwin. Mr. Uh, Zandi is here. Ms. Corey is here as the guardian ad litem. Uh, we're here uh, for uh, the guardian ad litem report that uh, Ms. Corey had filed and uh, hear comments from the parties and uh, make some rulings related to uh, parenting plan and the like. That's correct. Did uh, both sides submitted declarations? Did your honor receive those and have an opportunity to review them? Um, I am really good about reading everything that I get. And so I will tell you what, um, what I've received and what I've reviewed. Uh, starting with the most recent filings, uh, Jay Chamberlain, I read her declaration. Cindy Chase, I read her declaration. Uh, Daryl Harris, I read his declaration. Uh, the declaration of Lily Wynn, uh, submitted on 23 of February, I read that. Post findings, I reviewed that, submitted by Ms. Baldwin. Uh, there's some sealed healthcare records, about 14 pages. Um, I reviewed that. Um, I reviewed uh, the declaration of, of Jad Curtis uh, from file on the 22nd. I reviewed his proposed uh, parenting plan. Um, I also reviewed uh, visitation notes from connecting families. Um, there's some additional um, sealed personal health care records that Mr. Zandi submitted on the 22nd from Ms. Lovely and others. I reviewed that. There's also uh, Ms. Corey's uh, full report that I reviewed. And I actually went back a little bit further and reviewed some healthcare personal silk health, sealed personal health care records submitted by Mr. Zandi on the 20, pardon me, the 16th of September, 2022. Um, with that, um, I'm uh, Chelsea Baldwin for the record, and I represent um, Ms. Wynn, who's the mother of eight-year-old Benjamin. Um, we're asking the court to adopt my client's proposed parenting plan. It closely mirrors the guardian ad litem's recommendations. It's not exactly her recommendations, but it's a close mirror. Um, but we are asking the court to consider protective factors uh, concerning the domestic violence as well as the alcohol issues. Um, I'll note that there's sort of a cultural phenomenon of if you say something well, enough Governor, times. Not to, not, not to cut you off, I, I know we're on a GAL review. I don't know who you want to hear from first, uh, Judge. If my client's the petitioner filed the first declaration. I don't have any issue if Ms. Baldwin goes first. I want to make sure we're all on the same page. We're not on any motion, so it's up to your honor. Probably Ms. Corey probably should have the first word. Uh, so I'll <laughs> Fair enough. Ms. Corey, Ms. Corey I, I read over your report. Any any uh, particular items you want to highlight or bring to the court's added attention? I don't think so. I think my report speaks for itself. Okay. And, and generally with these kind of the, with the, the GAL uh, reports being submitted, uh, there's not necessarily a good way of, of, of who goes first. Generally, with cases, we hear from petitioners first and respondents thereafter. So I think we'll follow that order today. Okay. And I'll, I'll, be brief, I'll be brief in my comments, Your Honor. This is a case that's been pending for uh, some time now. And just a brief history, I think, is kind of important in putting this all in context. This is a case in which my client uh, was always an extremely involved parent. There's some disagreement between how uh, high of involvement level that was. My client details for you that it was 50%, uh, if not more. Uh, these parties cooperated in uh, having Benjamin spend time, adequate time with both parents. And I, I think that's largely uh, borne out in the GAL investigation. It was at the onset of COVID well, where unfortunately these parties had some disagreement as to uh, what was going to happen uh, with Benjamin. My client files a petition uh, to establish a parenting plan and lock up what he would uh, tell you was the arrangement uh, throughout, uh, which is roughly a joint uh, parenting plan. At that point, uh, acting pro se, again, and, and I think even from a practitioner standpoint, uh, COVID set everything into a spiral of uh, somewhat uh, chaotic events. Uh, the courthouse uh, operated under very different rules. Uh, case processing changed dramatically during that period of time. And unfortunately, uh, my client in, in the case with Benjamin, uh, it kind of got lost in the shuffle a little bit. Uh, he spun his wheels for a period of time. Uh, and, and during this period, again, is where we see a diametric change in kind of this, this case in the visitation, the custody, and what the parties were doing uh, related to Benjamin uh, having adequate time with both parties. 
my client details for you that it's uh, during this period of time after Ms. Wynn was served with the petition that she uh, unilaterally started withholding the child uh, under the guise of domestic violence and substance abuse and issues uh, that were just never an issue. And again, I think that's borne out in the evaluations and the GAL uh, findings and report. Uh, but she's under the uh, guise of, well, it's COVID, you're not going to see the child. Well, you have these issues, you're not going to see the child. And what became a 50-50 or at least very involved uh, relationship between my, my client and Benjamin uh, turned into this withholding action in which he's now uh, unfortunately having to fight for every minute of time he can get with his child. He hires me, we go into court uh, back in the summer. Uh, after an extended uh, absence outside of this child's life, uh, essentially starting from the bottom of the hill and trying to work back up. And it's during this time that Ms. Wynn makes these allegations. And again, I, I think if you look at prior cases in which she had custody disputes with older children, uh, this is almost cut and paste from the same allegation she raised back then. Uh, again, I think this has been uh, unfortunately uh, kind of by her direction and her uh, strategy in this where she makes these allegations, hope that something sticks. Back in August, the court was primarily concerned with the fact that there was an extended absence uh, of time in which my client wasn't seeing uh, Benjamin. Again, he, he thinks that was uh, purely um, done through withholding measures of the mother, uh, but he gets uh, pursuant to the court order two hours per week for two hours, three hours per week for two weeks, and then the matter may be reviewed for extended expanded visits upon additional information being received through the evaluations below and or GAL, GAL input with consideration for the professionally supervised notes. We now have all that information. Uh, my client goes and, and immediately sets up an evaluation for, from awakenings in which he gets a uh, substance abuse evaluation. That comes back largely clean. Uh, what happens? Blom says, well, they didn't consider everything I wanted them to. Therefore, the results of that are should not be considered by the court. And again, we have the professional saying that based on the evaluation, based on the input that she gave, it just didn't rise uh, to the level of any uh, treatment. Uh, and again, mom, not happy with that. We go through the GAL investigation. Ms. Corey does a thorough report, investigates what she needs to, comes forward with a recommendation that is putting these parties back into a position of my client, and most importantly, of having ample uh, time with the child, you know, pursuant or at least consistent with uh, what was uh, happening prior to the pandemic. And what does mom do? She says, well, there's a, there's a conflict there because Ms. Corey and a family member of hers dated a family member of, of, of Ms. Wins, and therefore the, the results of that evaluation are somehow uh, ineffective. And again, this is traditionally in every turn, there's been an obstacle that's been placed by Ms. Wynn. We go forward on the domestic violence uh, evaluation. Uh, Ms. Lovely conducts that evaluation. It, you can see through the findings that it's a, a very borderline call. She recommends the very low end of services and treatment for my client. There's been no physical uh, domestic violence in the past. There's been really nothing outside of, well, if anything, there's these control issues. Um, gives him 26 uh, weeks of, of treatment. My client, although you know he disagrees that there was ever a domestic violence uh, issue between the two of them, goes through and he's now complying with that. And the information provided to you shows that he's a leader in the classes. Uh, the information provided to you shows that if anything, uh, he's on the very low end risk range uh, as identified by that report. So again, we have all these allegations being made and just none of them are substantiated by the professionals that there's any kind of issue. Lastly, and I think very importantly, we have these visitation notes. And I think if you look at those visitation notes, and we provided you what we had uh, from reconnecting families on there, they're in all the visits since the fall, zero concerns. Uh, in fact, if you look specifically at that language, it shows that now, my client is not only doing well, he's doing exceptional with those visits. The child uh, acclimated back to time with dad very, very quickly. And if you look at that, and again, you don't usually see those. I, I, I look at these you know, as part of the job very routinely. And the strengths that are coming from those visits, again, speak volumes about the strength of the relationship that my client has with this child. Uh, you'll see there's comments that both are feeling more at ease with smiles and laughter. That's certainly positive. 
You'll see another one from early January that states, you know, Benjamin is excited to see his dad as he bounds into the office and has a great time. So again, we, we get that. We now get the you know, information from the GAL that shows that there's really no concerns, but very minimal concerns there were are being not only dealt with, but um, dealt with to a large degree in, in an abundance of just my client showing to the sport. And, and he said this back in his declaration in summer, I'll do whatever the court deems necessary for me to get back to that relationship I had with my child prior to the pandemic. And this is uh, one of the cases where the actions are again, lining up with the words that were presented and by my client back in uh, the summer. This is a good dad. Uh, this is a dad who has always been involved. Uh, unfortunately, his timing was terrible when it came to filing this action uh, at the onset of the pandemic, no fault of his own. And we were all going through and navigating a whole new set of circumstances. And here we are now where the child is doing exceptionally well with my client. All of the concerns uh, that Ms. Wynn uh, raised back in the summer and now new allegations that she's raised in her most recent declaration have all largely been disproven. Uh, we have a GAL with a lot of experience who did a very thorough report uh, who didn't find a lot of credence in any of the uh, uh, allegations that were raised. We have a mother who continues to go back to that well. Well, if, if it didn't work the first time, I'm just going to up the ante a little bit uh, so that I get what I want. We have a mother who has traditionally in past uh, cases done the exact same thing uh, with past fathers of her uh, older children. And we have this uh, unfortunate cycle of the uh, mom who's trying to just withhold the child as, as I would say a control measure, uh, trying to uh, keep my client and his visitation under her thumb. And that isn't what's best for this child. This child has a, both parents, two parents uh, that love him and care about him. That's a positive thing. My client respects that and acknowledges that of this win. Unfortunately, the other side of the coin, that's not reciprocated. We have mom who's just trying to use this as a control measure, uh, again, through further withholding uh, measures at which she's stooping to lows of making allegations that just simply are not founded. We get the results from awakenings. And what does mom do? She contacts awakenings, the uh, provider, and says, well, you're wrong. You need to do more. We've given you updated information from that in which uh, the, the specialist, the, the, the expert in this case, says there was a DUI from 15 years ago, and there's been allegations that were largely unfounded raised by mom. That tends to be a common theme throughout this case, and it doesn't give rise to any substance abuse issue. Rather than acknowledging that and saying that's great, we get a declaration from mom that says, oh, well, not only has there passed uh, alcohol issues, but there's also drug issues. My client doesn't have any past drug issues. We provided information and he voluntarily went and got a hair follicle test at the onset of this case, which came back clean. Unfortunately, the, the further we progress in this case, mom doesn't get what she wants. She doesn't get the answers to that. And there's more allegations. Simple fact of the matter is we now have a GAL investigation and, and findings and a recommendation. The court asked for that back in August. Court also asked that my client uh, jump through a series of hoops uh, to ensure that he didn't have the problems that were alleged by mom. He's done that. We provided you the information on that. This is simply a dad who wants to be a good father to his child. And you can see through those visitation notes that that relationship is strong. Despite the absence, which again is no fault of my client, uh, but despite that absence between he and Benjamin, Benjamin has taken right back to him just as it was uh, prior to the onset of filing this case uh, during the COVID pandemic. We want to get back to that point. Uh, my client details for you that it's always been his intent to get to that joint plan that they enjoyed a couple of years ago. Most importantly, that Benjamin was thriving under. That's his goal. But he's also realistic enough now to realize that there's a series of steps to, to go through and to make this again as beneficial for the child as possible. We agree on a temporary basis, largely with Ms. Corey's uh, recommendation. We're asking the court to adopt that. The parenting plan that we have proposed in anticipation of today's hearing largely reflects those recommendations. My client is asking uh, that you uh, adopt that on a temporary basis until we can get to trial and get through kind of what this level of withholding is. And some of these tactics, which largely equate to alienation type uh, behaviors of mom.
Uh, we do think it's appropriate, again, for the eight-week phase-in plan. Again, as suggested on, I believe it was page uh, 28 of Ms. Corey's uh, report, we think that's appropriate. My client is agreeable to that. He's also agreeable in asking you for these overnights to start at the expiration of those eight weeks. And that, uh, again, uh, the recommendation be adopted, which is the, and Ms. Corey gives a couple of different options on that. My client has suggested or at least proposed that it be the every other weekend from Friday at 6 until Monday uh, after school or 6 p.m. if there's no school, in addition to that midweek. And I think that's important, again, because this is not a father who uh, isn't available. This isn't a father who doesn't have experience having a child for extended periods of time. And breaking this up with having that alternating week uh, overnight from Wednesday to Thursday or every Wednesday to Thursday, is appropriate, again, given the child's age and, and expectations and my client's ability as a father. He's a good father. There's never been, again, any issues raised until we get into court. And then as is not uncommon, we have just kind of a mushroom uh, cloud effect of, well, I'm going to say this, I'm going to say this, I'm going to allege this, hoping that something sticks. And again, those reports just don't indicate that. Giving the child ample time with my client uh, and with his mother is, is what we want. Uh, we think that is certainly in Benjamin's best interest. And on a temporary basis, we are asking you, and we certainly think it's, it's, it's long overdue uh, for my client to get back to some kind of normal visitation uh, with this child who, by all intents and purposes, thriving in, with his time with dad and loves his time and enjoys his time with his father. So again, my client is asking that you adopt her proposed parenting plan. It does closely mirror the guardian ad litem's recommendations, but does have um, safety um, provided for both my client as well as the child. Um, counsel tries really hard to say that these are new allegations and gee, every single one that she makes, you know, when one fails, she just creates a new one. And you didn't go back to 2020 in your file and that's reasonable. But if you went back and looked at my client's pro se declaration, doing the best she could in a court system that's not familiar to her, um, back in 2020, she made these same allegations that there was physical abuse, um, that there was issues, um, significant issues with the father and that he was largely absent. Um, that declaration details that from age zero to age two, the father had a single overnight alone and from two to age five, um, essentially pre-pandemic time period, um, the father slowly over that time period worked up to an every other weekend type plan. Um, but that was where he was when the pandemic started. Um, the pandemic um, was a challenging time for both parties. Um, my client detailed previously in the guardian ad litem, um, I believe has in her report, um, that father fell ill and no one knew what it was. Um, and so in an abundance of caution, uh, visit stopped at that point. Um, so the absence since then, neither party is able to get into court, and there was withholding issues where Mr. would not return the child when the child went for visits, um, and those were significant uh, episodes. My client does detail that he does have an alcohol problem. The alcohol evaluation indicates the same and that there is a need for treatment. The concern here is that the court ordered collateral input. This is a self-report only. So Mr. Uh, Mr. Curtis, in this case, gave a self-report, I'm fine, I have no issues, and the evaluation even says, and we highlighted for you the information where the evaluator says, gee, this is hearsay, so I'm not going to consider any of Mrs. Wynn's input. That's not the evaluation standard, that's a legal standard, and my client provided the conviction data, also videos, as well as her own testimony about things she had personally seen and witnessed. The idea that that's hearsay simply isn't legally correct, but also is not the evaluation standard. My client at this point is just simply asking that Mr. Curtis not drink during his time with the child and the time period immediately before that. It's not an unreasonable request and not one that's designed to block his visits whatsoever. Similarly, we have domestic violence. We have a significant history of domestic violence that is not new. It is not something created recently. It goes back to 2020 when these parties were representing themselves. And we have a professional expert report that says that Mr. Curtis has significant issues and needs at least six months of treatment. Um, the domestic violence evaluation by Ms. Lovely says there's a pattern of controlling and abusive behavior. And it's referenced that it's both as to my client as well as towards the child. 
Um, even though the report was generated and completed back in September, Mr. Curtis didn't begin treatment until January. He essentially has only a single month of a six month program on board. And his uh, evaluations that he's submitted, one I believe is before he even really started. Um, and the second one that he produced and noted needs improvement in several areas. Um, Alden, can I ask you in, in Ms. Lovely's report where it indicates that the, the father was violent towards the child? Yes, it says uh, Mr. Curtis has displayed a pattern of controlling and emotionally abusive behaviors towards my client. Um, and then uh, it also states there appears to be evidence of controlling behaviors specifically related to their son, as well as allegations of emot emotionally abusive behavior, uh, which appeared linked uh, appeared to be linked to jealousy and sexual entitlement. So the jealousy and sexual entitlement does not apply to the child? No, that would not apply to the child. Okay, thanks. Um, so again, treatment for this only began a month ago um, in a six-month treatment program. Um, counsel says, oh, she's just repeating uh, old allegations. Um, that would be very easy for them to show, and they have not done so. Um, so again, simply just throwing it out there, hoping that that sticks. Um, but this is something that evidence, if it was in their hand, it'd be very easy for them to provide. Um, so again, in this case, the child has a right to be safe. My client has a right to be safe. Um, and those are really the keys to what my client is asking for. We have two professional recommendations for treatment. One has just started and one hasn't started at all. So on the alcohol issue, even without my client's input, the alcohol evaluator still recommends treatment that he uh, participate in a treatment um, modality. So in this case, um, it's also important to know that my client has been primary and she always has been. Um, Mr. Curtis is uh, desperate to claim 50-50 time. My client alleges because he doesn't want to pay child support. But even when you go back to 2020, my client says that's just never been the case. And her witnesses also say that's never been the case. He provided essentially daycare services when the child was in uh, was in school when the uh, mother's family couldn't provide child care. So essentially, he was the alternate child care. Um, what was the length of time that that occurred? That was the time pre-COVID. So essentially, ages um, three to five. So three to five, okay. And then around about five is when the pandemic started, and then that's really when visits stopped. And now child is eight. Thanks. So um, there, my client does report there is a history of food restriction um, with the child. Again, that would fall in line with the domestic violence findings of controlling behavior um, and controlling behaviors associated with the child. Um, my client is why she's asking for there to be two additional visits in the same vein that they've been doing. Because although the visit notes um, indicate there aren't concerns, these visits are all happening exactly at the dinner hour, and there's only two meals that have been provided or two snacks that have been provided. My client's just concerned that he basically doesn't know how to do this because he hasn't done this. Um, and so she's looking to ensure that the child is be being provided just simply basic care needs. Um, it isn't a restriction. If you look at her proposed plan, it escalates very quickly and rationally, similarly to the guardian ad litem's proposed plan. And really, so that's the question is, what do we, what do, we do with this information? Um, we have a long absence um, from the father, um, and the child deserves to have a safe, child-focused, and rational plan to reintegrate father into some time. My client isn't trying to withhold that or prevent that. She's asking for a, a safe progression that is reasonable and that's designed to eliminate conflict between the parties um, and develop a healthy relationship between the father and the child. Um, so if you look at our proposed parenting plan, we are recommending that the parties only communicate via our family wizard. I think that that's, or a similar program. Um, I think that that's very reasonable, that there be no alcohol during the visits with the child or other substances. Um, there's just no need for that, if there's frankly any concern at all, that he continue with his domestic violence treatment with Olivia Lovely, um, that there be no smoking around the child and the child not reside in homes of smokers. Um, the child has asthma. Um, my client's recommending that both parents take the Love and Logic uh, for Parents class so that there's sort of a, a uniform um, base that both parents are operating off of um, as far as parenting the child. Um, as far as decision 
Um, my client should be the sole decision maker for now. Um, it doesn't mean that that would stay that way, but at this point, um, that's reasonable, especially given the domestic violence issues. And those are issues that may need to very well be sussed out at trial and for a uh, prior effect at trial to decide if domestic violence um, is a finding to be had under the 191 factors. As far as the phases, um, my client's asking for two weeks the same as they've been doing, which is essentially a two hour visit, that that continue to happen as it's happening now, but that father provides a dinner during that visit. Then to do um, three visits over six weeks, essentially every other week um, for six hours with essentially a, a family or friend supervisor, again, largely just to ensure the comfort of the child and the child's basic needs are met. Um, then moving to three uh, visits of 24 hours, so essentially an overnight visit um, every other week for six weeks. And then he would remain at that until he completes treatment, which should closely align to Olivia Lovely's treatment plan of six months. Uh, and that is to, he would remain at essentially a single overnight, but once he completes Olivia Lovely's treatment and the alcohol treatment and the parenting class, then he would move to essentially the every other weekend um, type from Friday to Monday. So an extended um, weekend time, again, because during school, uh, when school is in session, um, that puts these parties in a place where ideally they're not having a lot of contact with each other. That's a reasonable progression. This isn't, this is still a temporary hearing and this is not a final hearing. Um, so that's a reasonable place where we would get to prior to these parties um, having a final hearing at, at trial. My client is asking for a couple of special provisions. Um, the first is that in the summer, she has family in Vietnam and she would like to be able to visit them. That is a significant travel burden. Um, so she's asking a specific provision that she's allowed to travel in the summer for up to a month, um, but that if father misses time, he would be awarded makeup time um, if she's gone for that long. My client is asking for some special holidays to be included that are not traditional um, US holidays. The first is Tet. Um, so that's part of the Lunar New Year. So some time around that um, where specific celebrations um, happen. And then additionally, the Vietnamese are involved with Tet. Okay. Um, and then the Vietnamese um, ancestors. How many, how many days are involved with the Tet? Uh, we have four, um, essentially 48 hours. So slightly before the day, the day, and a little bit after. And that way, if there's travel involved, um, that would allow for travel up to the Seattle area, spend the night, have the festivities, and then get home the next day. What part of the year is it? It's Lunar New Year, so it moves around. What and part of the year is it? I do not know off the top of my head. I can find out. Said, Ms. Bliss looked that up. Apparently, it's <laughs> January. That sounds and right. it does legally go around sometimes. Yeah, Lunar New Year is usually close to traditional calendar New Year, but sometimes, but not exactly. And because it shifts um, with the lunar cycle, it shifts slightly. Um, yeah, I just want to make sure it wasn't like a huge shift on like one year January, next year September. No, no. I, it's I believe still a winter holiday no matter what. Um, but it doesn't. I don't believe it ever interferes with the Christmas holiday or another traditional holiday. That's a, that's a significant one. Um, additionally, my client is asking to be able to have days reserved for the Vietnamese ancestral worship. Um, that is. Uh, Nizal. Um, so essentially, when parties are honoring their ancestors, um, family gets together and honors them. Um, my client is asking for three 24-hour periods. Um, that does not cover all of their celebrations, but that would allow her to make sort of strategic choices year to year um, to be able to celebrate um, those ancestral worship days. When do those three days occur? Um, she's asking that they not be set specifically um, for this reason. There's many more than three. Um, so she would, if she had her true request, it would be like 10. Um, but the reality is, is that three was sort of a modest uh, choice. And then they would move them around depending on who they were celebrating. So we're going to celebrate grandpa this year, and we're going to celebrate grandma next year um, so that they're kind of getting in celebrations. Additionally, they have family that's um, in the Seattle type area, and that might involve travel. So you might have a uh, the actual death date on like a Wednesday, um, but then they would celebrate it on a Saturday. So they aren't uh, purely set. So my client is asking for just three 24-hour periods to be able to uh, set those on those death days as planned to be able to celebrate. 
So um, it corresponds with a particular ancestor's date of death, and then yeah. that in close proximity to that date of death, there would be some type of celebration or gathering to memorialize and commemorate that person. Yes. Okay. Um, and, and as I said, there's many more than three. Um, I just sort of told my client that there has to be a limit um, and three is a reasonable number for the year. Um, and so we're just asking for a 24 hour period that allows for some travel um, north or south to get to family or to have family here. Um, and she'd have to give him a significant notice of those two. So those wouldn't just pop up, they would be um, anticipated. You mentioned travel south. You mentioned Seattle before, but is there a travel yeah. south? In the um, I think that there might be to Portland um, and that day, so not not significantly south. Um, so not we're not anticipating to California, but um, family in the sort of Pacific Northwest region. Okay, all right, thank you. As far as transport, this child is eight years old. Um, so for any in-person exchanges that both parties remain in their home or their car for the exchange, there just isn't a reason for anybody to keep getting out of their car um, or out of their home. Child is to be sent out um, immediately for the exchange. Um, the concern here is there was a historic pattern of uh, Mr. essentially holding the child, making my client come to the door, and then essentially asking for favors or her to come in, um, things that she did not want to do um, as part of that and using the child as sort of a bargaining chip. So child needs to be exchanged. No one should be getting out of their vehicles um, any which way. Um, finally, my client is asking um, that there be a specific requirement that specific regular meals and snacks be provided for the child, again, based on a concern that she has seen historically. Um, my client is asking for first choice care um, if the father cannot um, exercise his visit, um, that she would provide um, care or her family would provide care as they traditionally have. Um, and then she's asking for the child to have access to his communication devices, be they smartwatches, um, tablets, cell phones. Um, but with this specific limit, the child's devices are for the child to communicate, um, meaning that if child wants to call my client or to call Mr., he's free to do that, but the parents aren't calling in. Um, so I know that there can be a concern that you know, one parent or the other will in interfere with the other parent's time. My client says, I won't call, but the child should have access to be able to call if he desires um, or wants to text or video chat. Um, so it's the child's right to have the devices to communicate with both parents. And then finally, we have included specific passport language. Um, my client's the only one I, I anticipate wanting to utilize the passport. So I've made her as the primary parent, the keeper of the passport, um, but I've used just sort of some standard language that I've used in the past um, for maintaining, a, obtaining and maintaining a passport for a child, um, how it goes and um, who pays for it type of language. Um, so again, we are asking the court to adopt our plan. Um, it's reasonable for the child, um, it's balanced, um, and it still allows a progression. So this isn't a situation where my client is saying no, never, or give him a single overnight and then make us come back. She's allowing a, a progression to every other weekend, um, essentially, in this case. Um, so that's a very reasonable uh, and uh, progression prior to trial. Um, and so that's what we're asking your honor to adopt. Thank you. Mr. Zandi, a brief rebuttal? Yeah, very brief. And it, it's interesting when we go through and listen to that um, discussion of these different requests being made by Ms. Wynn, that you look at who the, the, the controlling and what the, again, the allegation of who's controlling and who's not. This is the only time that I can recall specifically in 17 years of practice where somebody's asking that meals be included in a parenting plan. My client was charged with feeding Benjamin when he was one, two, and three years old. Certainly he can feed him at eight years old. That's first and foremost. Second of all, she wants to, to chew off one month of extended time in the summer so that she can go on vacation. Isn't willing to give anything back in return to that other than makeup time. She did ask for three 24 hour periods for uh, to celebrate these, uh, and I, I forget the name, I apologize, uh, these, these deaths of the family. Again, that is, if counsel saying that there's upwards of 10 of these, I would assume that Ms. Wynn can just schedule these other deaths and celebrate other members of her family who have passed on that don't interfere with my client's visitation. Again, this is going to be an issue where that's going to be a control mechanism you know, that is going to impact my client. And again, just further alienates him 
uh, from his child. And that's not where we're at. We're on a temporary basis right now. My client should uh, have visitation with his child. She's had the last three summers, almost the last three years to do whatever she wanted to with this child, all the while withholding from my client who hasn't had any holidays, who hasn't been able to vacation at all, and who hasn't been able to enjoy the company of his child who he was very involved with. And again, that's borne out not only by his witnesses in the GAO the report, but in Ms. Corey's findings alike. So if we're looking at reasonableness and control, uh, I, I think it's pretty clear to see you know, where, where that lies. Things we agree with, no alcohol, that's fine. That should be mutual both ways. Again, there's been allegations uh, previously raised that Ms. Wynn uh, enjoys uh, cocktails. If it's good for one party, it should be good for the other. Uh, so that should be mutual. Our family wizard, we agree to that. That is fine. And the parenting class, I don't think my client would have an issue with that. I think everybody can benefit from that. And I think making that mutual, but again, hopefully will help uh, both of these uh, parties. What I would state, and again, I, I don't think council's comments are borne out in the information that not only Ms. Wynn provided, but certainly we provided. I'm gonna start with that substance abuse evaluation. That's pretty clear. It states that it wasn't just self-serving, one-sided by my client. Information we gave you, you know, from Ms. Jellum dated November 2nd of 2022 states collateral information was obtained from Lily Wynn. However, there was nothing to back up the information she provided as being fact, uh, other than a DUI conviction and a video of Jad appearing intoxicated. And again, the DUI was 15 years ago. So to say that that was a self-report she didn't have input is blatantly false. Second of all, the significant issues in the domestic violence evaluation, there was no mention of any issues related to Benjamin, no physical issues. There was no confrontations between the parties. I think it's pretty uh, easy to see what Ms. Lovely had reported, which was, if anything, there was some control uh, issues. And again, that was based largely on the collateral information provided by Ms. Wynn. And the fact that she says my client is very on the low end of the problem scale, that she recommended only uh, usually about half of what the treatment they typically do, I, I, again, is indicative of that. My client, and, and this is what I'll finish with, to suggest that as a father, somebody is in a daycare position or is relegated to child services when it's convenient uh, as a glorified babysitter is offensive. Um, I understood it from the comments that that was what was being alleged when Benjamin was a child and my client was at home. Uh, going to school or otherwise caring for this child and the suggestion that well he was just there as a babysitter uh, only for this child again is 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 blatantly offensive and kind of goes to the overall theme of our concerns are related to this going back to the date of my client filing that needs to change we need to even this out a little bit and this is a child who is ripe for having more time with dad and resuming that normal relationship all the information before the court shows that it's appropriate. Uh, Ms. Uh, Corey's recommendation, again, shows that's appropriate. And, and again, I, I would rest on those visitation notes that say that this child is ecstatic to see dad. It bounds through the door to see dad. And I, I don't think that can be underscored. And that is not the reaction that a glorified babysitter gets. That's a father. That's a, uh, an individual who has a loving, caring relationship with his child. And to suggest that he uh, somehow needs to feed his kid meals when he was doing that for years is, is, and that he's a babysitter is, is, again, it's offensive. And that needs to change. And that's kind of the attitude that's been represented throughout this case. Thank you. Ms. Corey, any, any final thoughts? Yes. Um, so I was surprised as we sat here today when uh, I went and reviewed the recently filed documents. Um, that alleged a conflict of interest, um, thinking very hard because it was over 20 years ago when either one, uh, uh, one of my three daughters were dating, um, I assume that Miss Wynn's brother must be Howie. Am I correct, Miss Wynn? Okay. Um, and that surprises me to learn that that uh, if she was aware of that, why she didn't mention that from the get-go, from the very beginning. Um, I was not aware of that. As I said, it was over 20 years ago. Um, and it is true that uh, her brother was in my home a few times during 
during the time he was dating my daughter, I had no comments to make to anyone about the nature of their breakup. Um, they were both adults, wasn't my business. Um, so I, even learning this after the fact, I don't feel that there is a conflict or would have been, even if I would have realized it at the beginning. Thank you. Thanks. One final question of the parties, the issue of the Benjamin's name. I didn't hear any comments from either party that there was some briefing on that issue. There was, I don't know that the court can do that at this stage absent agreement. I think that that's probably a trial issue. Okay. Thanks. All right. I appreciate that the, the briefing and the argument provided by the parties and Ms. Corey, thank you for your report. Uh, so what we know, uh, Benjamin, I think he's nine now and he's, um, you know, during his early years, it sounds like the, the parties didn't necessarily live together, but there was an arrangement where uh, Mr. Uh, Curtis would come in and watch the child uh, while mom was working. And, you know, daycare, that's a, not a short period of time. Uh, when you're talking about that type of uh, daycare during the day, it's generally probably eight, nine hours. Uh, so the, obviously the father has some, uh, a lot of experience in caring for, the, for Benjamin. And I think that's uh, borne out in the, the visit notes. The visit notes, they, they struck me as being uh, overly happy. Um, I mean, if, not, not in a pejorative sense, but they were very positive. Uh, the visit notes and it reflected what seemed to be a, a good solid relationship uh, there were no concerns raised of, of fear or cowering or uncomfortableness uh, it indicated that there was a, a good bond there between father and son um, what we know is that for a period of uh, time a couple of years maybe less a little a little more uh, that there was uh, not a lot of visitation between dad and, and benjamin uh, due to one thing or the, or the other. I think one thing is clear, both parents have control issues. And that's not, it's not a criticism. I think they both have control issues. I think Mr. Uh, Mr. Curtis's control issues are brought out in the uh, evaluation by Ms. Lovely, uh, that there is low risk there, but uh, he has some control issues. Um, and that I think uh, the control issues that uh, Ms. Wynn have, has are, are borne out in uh, the, making a recommendation that the court ordered that uh, the father feed the child. I was actually kind of taken aback by that, and I was I was going to ask in jest, and maybe I shouldn't even bring this up now, but uh, if there was going to be a daily caloric request, um, I mean, it, to me, it struck me as is very unusual, um, and so I think that underscores the issue of potential control by the mother. So both parties have those those issues, uh, and have different manifestations. Uh, obviously, both both of concern, um, but of limited concern. So the issue with the guardian ad litem conflict. A 20-year issue, a 20 happening, something happening 20 years ago, uh, not raised by the, the party maybe who's in the best position to remember that, uh, strikes me as inconsequential, and I, I take no, no, I take note of it, but put no weight on it. The SUD evaluation indicates that there's not, not necessarily any treatment recommended, but make basically a, a short education class. I'm fine with that. I'll, I'll require that and also have a restriction that during father's time that he not consume alcohol during his time and eight hours prior. I think that's a, a reasonable request and uh, is in the best interest of Benjamin. The passport uh, guidelines, I think that's fine. I think uh, the mother's probably in a greater position to utilize that with more frequency. Um, and so uh, I'll adopt those uh, guidelines provided in Ms. Baldwin's proposed parenting plan. Um, as far as, I'll get to the parenting line here in just a moment, the specifics of it. Um, but just want to talk about, I'm, I'm fine. I think it would be helpful. I, I think all, all parents, we would all uh, be uh, well instructed by taking additional classes. I'm fine with both requiring both parents to take the love and logic class and both parents taking a children in between or children in the middle. I'm not sure of the exact title. I think that's reasonable. And I think that's Helps parents just uh, raises a new perspective and, and, and vistas. Um, the, there was a request for a special event from June 30th to July 2nd. Um, I, I read over that. I'm not inclined to grant that at this time, so I'm not. Um, as far as the, I'll go and get into the parenting plan at this point. Um, so this is what I'm thinking, is that because there is what appears to me a, a strong, comfortable relationship, there's uh, some, Mr. Curtis is, is involved currently, 
uh, albeit a, a relatively short period of time, a month, month and a half in the uh, domestic violence uh, class. Um, and there's restrictions as to alcohol that the phase one uh, starts on March 1st, so tomorrow. Um, and there'll be a three hour visit uh, on, on Wednesdays and every Saturday for six hours. Um, if we need start times, it'll be from 11 a.m. until 5 p.m. And on Wednesdays, it would be from five until eight on, on that. And that'll be that'll occur for two weeks. So that'll happen on the first and that'll happen on the, the eighth. And then phase two will commence uh, thereafter, and that'll be um, commencing, uh, continue through, and, and then start phase two starts on March 17th. That's a Friday, and that's when there'll be overnight starting. So it'll be every Friday at 6 p.m. until Saturday at 6 p.m., and the Wednesday will still continue from the 5 to 8. That'll be the three-hour period. That will continue until we get to March 31st. On March 31st, we move into phase three. March 31st, that'll be uh, altered. Oh, pardon me. On phase two, that'll be every weekend uh, for those two weeks, uh, every Friday, 6 p.m. to uh, Saturday at 6 p.m. And then on phase three, which starts on March 31st, uh, that'll be alternating weekends, uh, Father's Time from Friday, Friday at 6 p.m. until Sunday at 6 p.m. Also uh, continuing the weekly midweek of Wednesday of three hours, five to eight. Phase four will begin on May 5th, that's a Friday, and that'll be alternating weekends as defined by Friday, first, third, and fifth weekends from Friday at 6 p.m. until Monday after school or 6 p.m. if there's no school. Um, as far as the summer, um, it'll be uh, I'm fine with two non-consecutive week vacations for each uh, parent. The father will need to notify the mother by April 30th of his proposed two weeks, non-consecutive weeks, and mother will need to notify the father by May 15th of, of her weeks that she chooses. Um, and if, if foreign travel is, is going to happen, then those two non-consecutive weeks can be two consecutive weeks. The exchanges, I'm fine with those uh, limitations of both parties staying in their car, staying in the home, and allow the child to transport himself between, between parents. Um, the phone of the child, I think, uh, provision for reasonable communication with the other parent at, at reasonable times for reasonable durations is, uh, should be included in the parenting plan. The, uh, as far as the, the TET or the Lunar New Year, I'm fine for a 12 hour period um, during that period. So it would be like from 10 to 10 or from nine to nine or eight to eight uh, that the mother could spend that time with Benjamin to celebrate that. As far as the ancestral commemoration uh, holidays um, or ancestral commemoration dates, um, with that, I am fine with the mother avoiding the interference with the father's parenting time. It sounds like there's some flexibility as Ms. Baldwin indicated that if uh, a loved one had passed on a Wednesday, then there might be a get together on a Saturday or vice versa. So there's some flexibility. It may not necessarily be on the date of commemoration. And I, I wanna be sensitive to that. And I'm going off largely on, on the comments of Ms. Baldwin that indicated that there is some, some flexibility that the, the exact date is not necessarily uh, super important. And that being the case, then, then she can certainly involve uh, Benjamin in those uh, uh, commemorative activities, uh, but they shall avoid interference with the father's time. As far as the, the Vietnam trip uh, this year, I recognize probably foreign travel has been limited because of COVID concerns and there may not have been, um, but there's also been a period of time where the father's not had time with the child. So there's not gonna be, uh, there may be a, a two week period if, if Ms. Wynn elects to do that, she can take a two weeks summer vacation and, and travel with Benjamin to Vietnam, but not the 30 day stay. And uh, so, and I'm doing that just because there's been an extended period of time where the father has not had uh, time with, with the child. And I think 30 days is just too much too soon. Um, and I recognize that Ms. Wynn's probably concerned that, that a long time has been, that she hasn't been with her family, but she'll, if she so chooses, she can use those two weeks and, and be with family. Decision-making will be joint, um, medical, educational, 
religious, extracurricular, piercing, tattoo, hair changes, dramatic, uh, will be be joint. Family wizard, uh, I think that's reasonable. The parties will will utilize that, sign up for it, and that'll be their their means of communication. Um, we talked about love and logic. Um, I'm not uh, placing any um, uh, any limitations or restrictions on anyone. Um, and the one other issue, I think I got it all. I think those are the items that I had highlighted, and I may have missed something that you you all are interested in. So I'm, I'm open yes. to clarifications. So the your Honor made a restriction as to alcohol. Are you adopting sort of the standard UA provisions that we've included at, towards the end of the plan? I'm fine with that. Uh, you know, if somebody wants to make a request and then within a certain period of time, and then if uh, it shows to be a negative, then the person who pays for it uh, eats that cost. Otherwise, the reimbursement would be appropriate. Um, and as your and honor requiring holidays. that, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Mr. Zanton. No, I was going to ask about the remaining holidays. I didn't do a direct comparison. Christmas, July 4th, Thanksgiving, Halloween, is there anything specifically that you want omitted or included? Um, as far as the general holidays, other than the specific ones that we mentioned about Tet and the ancestral holiday, um, I'm, I'm, I'm inclined to adopt the proposal by Mr. Curtis for holidays, including Mother's Day, Father's Day, Fourth of July, Thanksgiving, Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, birthdays of the child, and three day weekends not listed elsewhere. Okay. Okay. Uh, Sorry, Council. That's okay. Um, is Your Honor requiring that Mr. Curtis complete his treatment with Olivia Lovely? That's expected. Okay. Um, and then we had asked for a restriction on um, smoking or essentially taking the child, um, not necessarily into a home that smokes, but leaving the child there or having the child spend overnights in a home where they're smoking due to his asthma. Seems reasonable. Should we just say no smoking around the child? Does that get us there? It doesn't quite, because then it's, you could have a smoker's house that the kid is in and it's nothing but second, third hand smoke. So I, I tend to prefer my language there. So it's, it's interesting because, you know, if you go into a home where there's a, a smoker uh, resides in that home, there's obviously residual particulate in the air, which can uh, exacerbate asthma. Um, and Yet we we don't live in a bubble. We drive in cars. We drive behind diesel pushers, and we inhale those fumes. Uh, that's limited in time. Um, I, I don't want to I don't want to be overly restrictive in that there's precautions that can be taken for somebody who suffers from asthma if they have by chance visit family or friend that that is a smoker and they're not smoking in front of the child. The child can uh, mask up or the like. And I think I think. The parents, I think, are going to be in the best position to protect Benjamin and be aware of his, his asthma and how it impacts him and be uh, reasonable in, in the response. So I don't want to be overly uh, limiting and uh, defer to the parents and their protection of their child. So I guess, efforts, go ahead. I'm sorry, Ron. Maybe best efforts to keep Benjamin outside the purview of smokers or homes with smoke in them and uh, we can craft language in there to kind of, I think, meet that idea. In, in this case, I think if you look at my language, it prevents the child not from just simply being around, like that happens. And I agree with your honor's sort of bubble comments, but it says the child won't sleep in a home, essentially that is a smoker's home. I think that that's a reasonable sort of balance between being able to have, visit somebody, but not being in a position where overnight, where you really wouldn't wear, wear a mask as an eight or nine year old, um, that's sort of a reasonable balance between those two concerns. And it's interesting too, because some, some smokers, their significant other requires them to go outside and smoke. And yet they, they're a smoker and they're being, and the child might be in a smoker's home. So I, I, I wanted a more open-ended, more flexible um, language, um, just pr protecting the child and parents to take reasonable efforts to protect the child from uh, exacerbating his asthma around smokers. Right. I think those are all my questions. Um, my preference, um, so as to, we had alleged um, 191 factors, I just asked that those be reserved for um, a final determination. And then absence, oh, and I have under decision-making, I always add sort of standard language that is 
um, routine things the primary parent can just take care of without um, notification. If there's anything that pops up out of those, then that would require. Okay, sounds good. Um, so with that um, presentation, my preference is to, because your honor wants this to take effect so quickly, um, is to set presentation next week. Mr. Zandi? I'll get going as quick as I can to crank out an order. Okay. That's fine. Okay. We'll set it to next week, March 7, for presentation. Very good. And I'm, Thank is you. Is it okay if I just email uh, your honor, CC counsel, a copy of that order yes. so it doesn't get delayed in the through the channels? Fine with that. That's a, that's a good, good, good approach. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to the party. Thank you.